So, so we have um, a nice bunch of people on, on the panel today that we'll be learning from, as, uh, as Arush says, journal editors and library publishers, or their GS users. So um, without any further ado, let's, let's meet the panelists and then we can have a discussion, hear their insights, um, and we will have time for questions uh, from the audience. So please do ask us any questions um, that you have um, and we will um, attempt to answer them. If we can't answer everything in the session, then I'm sure we can um, take some questions to answer afterwards and I'll be happy to do that. Um, so let's uh, get started and introduce, first of all, our um, journal editors. Uh, so um, shall we start with Abe Utson, who is um, Managing Editor of International Journal on Homelessness. Abe. Great. Well, uh, nice to be on the panel. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, yeah, so my name is Abe. I'm uh, an associate professor in the School of Nursing at Western University in London, Ontario. And as Judith mentioned, I'm the managing editor of the International Journal on Homelessness. And it's actually a journal that I led the development of. Um, we launched uh, just about two years ago. Our first edition was November in 2021. Uh, but there's several years of <laughs> development in advance of, of that launch. So it feels like a lot longer than two years, but um, <clears throat> we are, uh, as in the title, we are an inter international journal and we're very committed to, uh, to the Global South who are vastly underrepresented in publishing. And uh, we are also unique in that, so, you know, we're, we're a topical journal and that's part of what led to the development is that uh, in the issue of homelessness, you know, there's, there's no one discipline that, uh, that works on this issue. And, and many of us, like myself as a nurse who work on this issue, actually struggle to publish in our own disciplinary journals because it's, it's sort of out of the wheelhouse of, of most nurses. So. Uh, the, the journal really gives a platform to folks from all sorts of disciplines all over the world uh, with a common interest uh, to publish. And, uh, and so some of the things that we, we do to support that, and I'm sure this will come up later, is we accept uh, in submissions in seven different languages so that people can go through the review process in their uh, first language of choice. Uh, and we also publish folks in both English and their uh, first language if they if they did that review in another language. Uh, just to you know try to in, in addition to being open access is, is try to open up uh, access in other ways as well, such as through languages. Um, and we to, to do that we've got a, a big uh, international board of, uh, of many bilingual folks. Um, and yeah, it's it's going really great. We are uh, we just put out an issue with I think I want to say sixteen papers, which is pretty awesome uh, for us. It's definitely achieving beyond what we were hoping. And while we had started with looking at two editions per year uh, with special editions, we're already looking at three and probably four editions next year. So yeah, it's going going really amazing well. Uh, and, and through our discussion today, I'll, I'll talk a bit about how these systems and uh, folks like our librarians on the line are, are a big part of, of why it's going so well for us. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, so our other general editor um, who's with us is uh, Crystal Snyder. So Crystal, over to you. Awesome. Thanks for the invitation to the panel this, this morning. Uh, so my name is Crystal Snyder. I'm the team lead for the undergraduate research initiative at the University of Alberta. So uh, my office promotes and supports undergraduate research across all disciplines. We do a lot of different activities to support undergraduate research. So um, in around 2015, um, at that time, there were a number of undergraduate research journals on campus. Many of them were very discipline specific. Some were active and had been active for a long time. Several had gone dormant. Um, we started to hear from students that they were really looking for kind of a reliable outlet to uh, publish their undergraduate work. 
And so um, I sort of jumped in and, and we started this development process for Spectrum, which is uh, a multidisciplinary undergraduate research journal. We publish work across all disciplines. Um, and we also try to encourage students to publish work that is written in a way that's accessible to people from other disciplines. So not really a deeply technical journal. We're trying to sort of raise awareness of uh, undergraduate research in a way that will appeal to readers from across different disciplines. So um, we formed a committee of students at that time to begin working on uh, the planning and development of Spectrum, both with that idea that we wanted to sort of bridge some of those gaps in the ecosystem here, but we also wanted to uh, be mindful of how, as the undergraduate research initiative, uh, we could better support the ecosystem of student publishing at the U of A as a whole. So. Um, that was something that we kept in mind uh, during our policy development. And it was, uh, I think, similar to Abe, a very lengthy process. We didn't uh, expect at the outset that it was going to take us three years from the time we uh, came up with the idea of, you know, let's start a journal to our first issue in 2018. Uh, but uh, it was really worthwhile to take that time and uh, do the policy development and really think a lot about um, how the journal would be structured and how it would operate and how students would be involved and trained and supported through that process. Um, and I think that actually helped us a lot with our eventual application to DOAJ. So, um, and also helped address proactively some of the uh, operational continuity issues that we sometimes see with student journals out of the gate. So um, we've been publishing two issues a year since uh, 2018. And our library applied on our behalf actually for admission to DOAJ in 2020, and we were accepted in early 2021. Great, thank you. And so I think moving swiftly on to your uh, uh, colleagues in the library, <laughs> um, I'll introduce uh, Sonia Betts. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Sonia Betts. I'm the head of Open Publishing and Digitization Services at the University of Alberta, which is located in, in Edmonton in Canada on a Treaty 6 territory. Um, so the University of Alberta Library has had some kind of uh, like library journal hosting or publishing program in place since 2007. So we've got like a 16 year old program, a teenage program, uh, and we now support more than 70 open access journals, including everything from sort of scholarly peer reviewed publications from learned societies to like wonderful undergraduate student publications like Spectrum, which, um, which Crystal has mentioned already. Uh, we have a team of five people, including librarians and a publishing specialist, um, but we do this work in addition to a whole bunch of other uh, related um, and sort of tangentially related initiatives like our open educational resources program, uh, government information and web archiving, copyright literacy and digitization services. So the journal publishing is just a piece of what those five uh, team members work on. Uh, we've been supporting journals in DOAJ indexing since about 2017 when the team was just like me <laughs> and I had a really excellent practicum student uh, who worked with me to develop some different sort of workflows and processes for supporting journals through a DOAJ application. Um, but we've had journals in the directory of open access journals for much longer than that um, and they, they would have sort of worked independently on their applications in the past. So yeah, really excited to be here. Excellent. Thanks, Sonia. So um, um, moving on to Emily Carlisle Johnson, who's um, at the University of Western Ontario. Emily. Thanks, Judith, and thanks everyone for having me. So as Judith has said, I am a research and scholarly communication librarian at the University of Western Ontario in London, where part of my job, of course, includes supporting open access journals hosted on OJS, such as um, Abe and the International Journal on Homelessness. It is myself and one other librarian colleague, uh, Kristen Hoffman, that support this work. And between the two of us, we're probably able to dedicate less than um, one full-time equivalent total to this work. We do occasionally have some library assistants and co-op students who take on special projects. Um, like for example, this year, a library assistant and co-op student digitized back issues for three different journals. Um, but most of the time it's Kristen and I, and we support at the moment 36 uh, active journals, 15 of which are faculty journals, and then the rest are a great mix of um, undergraduate and graduate student journals. And then we also uh, host nine 
journals that are currently inactive that but that we suspect will one day maybe become active again. And our support includes things like training for the set and maintenance of journals, guidance in editorial policies and practices, validating standard identifiers, and then of course, um, indexing and dissemination of journal content. And I'll speak more to what that looks like over the course of this discussion. Great, thanks Emily. Um, so uh, finally on our panel, we have uh, Jeanette um, Hatherill from Coalition Publica. So Jeanette, hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, I work with Coalition Publica, which we discussed off the top, as a partnership between Erudzi and uh, PKP. And today, I am speaking really on behalf of the Erudzi sort of side of the of the team of the project. And Erudzi is an interuniversity consortium based in Montreal, Quebec. Um, and uh, it's um, a, a platform, a, a support for publishing uh, journals um, in uh, to support with digital publishing, knowledge dissemination. And so some of the services uh, that we offer or that ARUZ offer uh, includes production services. So XML, HTML, uh, PDF and EPUB production, uh, all based on kind of what the journals needs are for their dissemination. Um, we also, uh, because it is a platform, it is a dissemination platform, uh, it uh, libraries and uh, partners uh, across the globe can subscribe or become uh, partners and members of the ERIZ platform. And so there is distribution in 35 countries. So that kind of uh, dissemination, indexing visibility is kind of another part of the service uh, that ERIZ uh, provides, um, as well as certain services like uh, preservation, archiving, digitization, et cetera. So the ERIZ team itself is about 35 people, um, but the production team, the group that is really working directly with the journals to support that sort of production workflow of getting their journals up and disseminated online um, are is about uh, uh, 15 people with six people uh, in the tech team supporting the platform itself. And those people support um, uh, 320 journals on the platform um, and about 280 of those journals are scholarly or sort of peer reviewed journals. Other ones include what they call a cultural journal. So for example, um, art catalogs and, and exhibition um, uh, uh, publications and things like that. Um, so yeah, I'm delighted to be here and I'm excited to share more about the work that Erudzi has been doing uh, with DOIJ to index some of their journals uh, in the directory. Fantastic, thanks Jeanette. So now we've met everybody, um, we can uh, just start uh, talking about uh, uh, everyone's experiences and motivations and hopefully um, give people some uh, useful information um, if you're thinking of uh, um, in including your journal in DOAJ. So I'll start with the journal editors um, and talking about you know, the motivations to apply for inclusion. Um, Abe, I think your journal was, it's quite recent, I think, was added to DOAJ um, in November 2022. So I guess just about a year after its launch. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, tell us about um, why you uh, why you applied. Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, the, I think the, the number one, of course, is uh, is visibility. We are, you know, we're, we're still at relatively early in our growth phase and um, still just trying to, to make folks in the sector aware of our, uh, of our work and, and to see us as an opportunity. Uh, and so that, that's, I think, probably the number one. Uh, when we were doing our sort of due diligence on, on putting the journal together, this was obviously one of the places we looked. We, we said, you know, is anyone already doing a, a journal on homelessness uh, and so you know you, you look around and and that the directory was was one of the first places I checked and so you know I, I think I've I've always sort of been aware of the directory for quite a long time might even go back to uh you know student days of of easy ways to find articles that <laughs> um that were were free and open access and quick um, and so, yeah, so the directory's always been sort of in, in the back of my mind there. Um, 
and also, so so first is visibility. The second is sort of uh, sort of establishing because there is uh, very much a sort of credibility aspect of publishing, and that can be either sort of you know vague in terms of people want to be in good journals. Um, or very specific. I mean, many as as an international journal, many countries, uh, the the sector has requirements of of academics and and can be very strict. As like you can only publish in a journal with X impact factor, or that's going to count on your review or whatever. So uh, there's also sort of a, a motivation to build the the credibility of the of the journal beyond just the visibility. And, and so, um, yeah, having it, it recognized uh, as at the directory was a, was a first step that we could do. Of course, we also are pursuing indexing broadly, um, but, uh, but the DOAJ was also one that accepts you early into your, your journey uh, for indexing. So um, that's, that's a huge kind of benefit as well is, is to get in and invisible somewhere. Um, yeah, so visibility and credibility, I think we're, we're two big priorities. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, Crystal, um, I was gonna say what prompted you to apply, but then you, you didn't actually apply. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the library was aware that we wanted to apply, so it wasn't wasn't like they applied surreptitiously or anything uh, for us. But um, so very similar to Abe, I think our our motivation was around visibility uh, largely at the beginning. So uh, especially with student journals, uh, you know, there was a concern very early on with our planning committee that you know student journals have a great reputation for providing really good training opportunities for editors, but often the visibility is quite limited. Uh, sometimes it's very limited even within the own, the, you know, its own institution. And so we really wanted to think about, you know, how can we set Spectrum up so that, you know, yes, we're providing great training opportunities for the editors, but also um, actually expanding visibility and access to that uh, student work beyond our own institution and also attract submissions from other institutions as well. Um, so, you know, DOAJ was one uh, opportunity for us to do that. Um, the other thing that applying for DOAJ really helped us do, of course, I'm coming to this as, you know, um, the lead for the undergraduate research initiative. My role is educating uh, students about undergraduate research and um, scholarly practice. And so there was a real opportunity here with the framework of best practices and scholarly publishing that DOAJ provides. There was an opportunity to sort of you know, build that into the education that we were doing with the student team about, you know, we're not just going to make a journal and publish stuff like anybody can publish something on the internet. Um, but how do we do this in a way that, you know, is really in alignment with the best practices in scholarly publishing? How is this contributing to, you know, your place as part of an academic community? Um, and so, um, Sort of working through those best practices as we were uh, developing Spectrum and working through our policies actually, you know, sort of gave a lot of, um, it catalyzed a lot of discussion with the team about, you know, what, why do we do this? What are our responsibilities as editors and um, and publishers and, and so on? And so I think it gave the editors a sense right from the beginning as students um, of their responsibilities, not only to themselves and each other as an editorial team, but also to authors, reviewers, readers, you know, sort of the broader academic community. So um, I do think that, you know, there was a bit of more of a sense of ownership and pride in, in uh, what the students were doing. And I think, um, you know, even though they didn't actually go through the process of, you know, submitting the application in DOAJ, I think there was a real sense of accomplishment on, part, on the part of the student editors that, you know, um, being included in DOAJ, um, you know, does, as I've as said, kind of lend a, a bit of credibility to the work that they've been doing. So, yeah, that was kind of our motivation as well. Absolutely. I think that's great. And, you know, even more so that, you know, we do reject about 50% of the applications that we get. So, you know, um, I think it's, it is a good, good marker, especially for, for student journals, which, you know, that are really underrepresented in most databases. And yet, well, they're underrepresented in DOJ, but they're underrepresented even more <laughs> in other places too. Um, but uh, you said about giving uh, the journal more visibility 
um, outside of of your own institution. So has that has that led to kind of more um, submissions from outside? Yeah, so uh, I was going to address that in a, in a later question, but uh, essentially our yeah. submissions doubled yeah. in about a year. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but yes, definitely it has helped us achieve those goals. So, um, obviously we talked about, um, you know, libraries supporting journals, um, in the process of indexing. Um, so just, uh, want to ask, uh, you know, Sonia and Emily, um, you know, what, uh, what prompted you to start, um, um, supporting journal editors and and how it aligns with you know your the overall goals of um, your institutions. Emily, do you want to go first? Yeah, I would say it's um, similar reasons that the journal editors have just mentioned, like wanting to help journal ed journal editors and their journals um, receive that credibility, improve the discoverability of their content. Um, but I think Sonia mentioned this earlier too, this wasn't support that we have always provided. Um, it's actually only been more recent in the last few years. So I can give some context for that. Um, prior to 2017, all of our journals were hosted on the BPress Digital Commons platform, which we do still use as a repository service. Um, but at the time, we only had one repository manager to oversee everything. So journals that were on the platform didn't receive any kind of um, specialized support or more direct support. It was a pretty hands-off approach to everything um, just because of capacity. So in 2017, I was actually a co-op student at the time, um, and, but we migrated over all of the journals to OJS um, after Elsevier acquired Digital Commons. And with it, we were able to take a more hands-on approach to supporting journals, which is something that we wanted to do because um, the library has you know, a strategic mission to support open access, but also that we personally wanted to do um, just so that we could actually work with and help journals that journal editors that wanted to make their content open access and run a fully open access journal um, and to be able to guide them towards some best practices in open access publishing. So it was kind of that shift from a more hands-off approach to a hands-on approach that also really aligned with us being able to support journals with indexing and then to be able to help them achieve their goals of discoverability and, and credibility that are all wrapped in that. Great, thanks. Sonia, have you <laughs> have you got uh, anything um, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone sort of covered a lot of the main points. Um, it's interesting to hear Emily say that sort of 2017 was a bit of a turning point for their program because it was for ours as well. Um, and it just seems like maybe a little bit of a increased attention to this this kind of work. Um, at our own institution, the ability to secure some more resources for this work is what really did allow us to move forward with actually supporting journals instead of just kind of, you know, like being pretty hands off. Um, but now I think we, we see this, uh, the DOAJ application is like a major milestone in uh, journals development from being, uh, you know, just a, a twinkle in somebody's eye to a journal that, that is sort of actively publishing incredible research and, and developing a reputation um, in its discipline for that work. Uh, and those just like reputational benefits really are, I think, the, the biggest piece for us. Um, many of us and maybe librarians on this call do, do the work of um, consulting with faculty and grad students on how to identify an ethical publisher and avoid the so-called you know, predatory publishers. So that other piece of our work is probably very top of mind for lots of libraries, right? Well, we don't want our own journals being perceived as um, you know, unethical or, or predatory in some way. What are some of the things we can do to help them achieve um, you know, professional identity and and a reputation that helps them succeed in this environment. And that, that beneficial reputation has like a real positive cycle. So, you know, as more authors and readers trust the content, you see more submissions from authors who trust the journal, which in turn leads to sort of like an increasing um, uh, higher quality submissions and, and the journal just uh, has like additional success as it moves forward in that journey. So we feel like it's a really, really important piece of the piece of the puzzle. So yeah, we want, and for us too, right, having a number of journals that are successfully indexed in uh, DOAJ helps um, the external perception of what we're doing is sort of legitimate 
uh, valuable high quality publishing activity as well. Great, thank you. Um, so Jeanette, uh, uh, the motivations at LUD uh, the same or do you have any different uh, motivations there too? Yeah, well, I mean, many of the similar things that uh, professionalization, the mark of, of uh, dedication to editorial practices and everything, but particular to the Erudzi context uh, and is the French language context. So historically, uh, Erudzi has been very uh, much a French language or bilingual French English language platform for dissemination. It's, its historical roots is in the Quebec context. Um, so when DOAJ uh, in about 2018, is I think when this partnership began, uh, before my time at, uh, at uh, uh, Coalition Publica, but when that began, uh, DOAJ was really seeking to increase its non-English language uh, content, so increase the visibility of, um, you know, bibliodiversity and, and, and publishing in different languages. So the fact that Erudzi had this large corpus of French language material, it made a natural uh, partner for the DOAJ to expand that sort of, um, that, that type of content. And then, um, you know, the motivations on the Z side were very much sort of similar to some of the library publisher motivations, which is, um, you know, perhaps not that professionalization, because many of them were already at that point, but that articulation of the, the, um, professionalization. Um, there was, you know, that desire of increasing visibility and discoverability. Um, but having that sort of criteria um, and that standard really helped sort of motivate some of those conversations with journals to um, properly articulate and update the information on their websites, et cetera. So, so kind of um, being a little bit more uh, uh, open about their adherence to open criteria, for example. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so just turning again to the, uh, the, the journals, um, I want to ask Crystal and Abe um, whether your journals had any special considerations that you needed to, to think about in terms of applying to DOHA um, and any requirements that, you know, needed more effort um, for you to, uh, to meet the DOHA criteria. I mean, obviously, Crystal, yours is a student journal, so there's some specific criteria around that. Um. Yeah, so uh, in, in terms of DOAJ, the only really specific requirement for us as a student journal is that we needed to have uh, two PhD level advisors uh, for the journal, which for us was actually relatively straightforward because um, you know, the undergraduate research initiative, um, which I run, we already had an advisory committee at that point with faculty representatives. So it was pretty easy to find folks who would be willing to uh, sort of advise for both. Um, in terms of policy development, um, you know, I think probably the biggest challenge and, and probably the thing we've talked about most as, a, as an editorial team and that we continue to talk about and revisit over time is um, the peer review process. So um, with a lot of student journals, uh, most student journals rely to one extent or another on faculty review. Um, and our faculty advisors actually kind of steered us away from that early on. Um, because, you know, as, as most of you are aware, there's very few incentives for faculty members to review student work. Um, and faculty have their own peer review obligations, which are getting um, increasingly difficult for, for folks to keep up with. So, um, and our student committee also felt that it was really important as a student journal that it that Spectrum had an authentic sort of peer review process of students reviewing student work. So um, our development of our peer review process really took a lot of that into consideration, thinking, you know, we're working with, you know, inexperienced authors and inexperienced editors and also now potentially inexperienced or, or uh, reviewers with limited experience of the peer review process. So there was a lot of thinking about, okay, how are we going to prepare our reviewers and our editors to undertake that process? Um, and also, how are we going to support the editors in managing submissions from such a diverse range of disciplines? Um, that also comes with, with its own challenges, right? Um, so, you know, what we've landed on is, you know, we sort of have a mixed uh, review process of a graduate student and an undergraduate student, both of whom are sort of from the discipline that the, the submission is in, and then also a third uh, reviewer that's an undergraduate student in a different discipline who sort of looks at it with a different eye, not so much the technical aspects, uh, but, you know, is this accessible 
to readers from other disciplines? Are there things that maybe need to be clarified, you know, um, you know, just that sort of outside lens? Um, so we've gone through a number of iterations of that, uh, our template, our guidance for peer reviewers. We've collaborated a fair bit with our library team on training peer reviewers. Uh, we've also done a lot of work with our editors around sort of how do you interpret a peer review and how do you make that feedback, you know, how do you make that make sense uh, to the author when you're asking for revisions? So, um, you know, that, you know, other than being transparent about that, that wasn't a specific requirement of DOAJ, but it was probably the thing that we've spent um, the most time on. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of a lot of education um, involved in the uh, in student journals, um, and uh, which is good because you probably end up with a, a really a really strong process <laughs> at the end of it, which is great. So, um, Abe, um, can you? I mean, yeah. talk about any special considerations? Obviously, you've got the language. Um, uh, issues that you, mm -hmm. you'll accept uh, submissions in seven languages, which is brilliant. Um, mm. So, um, were there any other special considerations for the journal? Yeah, I, I, one, and, and actually, before I, I speak about one consideration, I just wanted to mention that, you know, in the process of putting together the journal, uh, there's actually a delightfully broad number of approaches one can take in, in putting together an academic journal, um, which is great, but it also means in, in crafting your own policies, it, it does feel a little bit like a, a choose your own adventure. Um, and, and so the library team was really helpful to, uh, I mean, essential, I, we, to be honest, we wouldn't have launched if the library team didn't have this service on, on supporting open access journals, we would have been completely lost. Um, and so, I mean, they could help us uh, with some sample policies and recommendations and best practices and that sort of thing, but there's still a lot of decision-making to be done. And so the indexing process actually really helps with that uh, because it raises sort of a number of questions and decision points that some of them we hadn't made yet. And so, in going through the process of, of the DOIJ application, it's like, oh, hey, we, we hadn't landed on this or our policy was too vague in this area. And so the, that process really helps. And, and actually each, each sort of point along the way, um, and so now we're looking at a, another indexing, uh, pushes us to consider further our own policies and, and procedures. So, so it's really helpful in that way. Um, so the, the only one I, I wanted to add is we had a kind of a unique partnership where obviously Western University is going to be the publisher, uh, but we have another institute that's been supporting our work and has some a bit of finances to help us with things like translation. Uh, so it was just sort of figuring out kind of who's named how and what that partnership looks like and, and what's ownership look like and what does everyone sort of want out of, out of the the work and how to be named and that sort of thing. So um, like if you look at our, our submission, Western's a publisher and then the Institute of Global Homelessness as a society or institution uh, named in that. And so it, it was nice, it worked out. We had sort of very different um, priorities in the work. So it was easy for us to decide kind of who was named how, but and that's again, some of the, the stuff you need to, to work out as you do this is, is where does this live? <laughs> virtually and, and real, who, if there's any finance involved in it, costs involved in it, where does that, you know, who, who picks that up and how. And um, so, yeah, I mean, just, just the whole process is just good to help push, push us to make decisions and as, a, as an editorial board. Great. I mean, you've obviously both had really good support from, um, from the library. Did you, use any of the PKP, um, uh, the DOAJ guide or other PKP documentation support to, to help as well? Yeah, we we definitely did. Um, and again, so so we had like, we had a wealth of resources <laughs> of, of potential approaches and, and that was definitely uh, some of what we looked at as well as really generous existing journals being like, hey, here's our whole pile of policies and 
here's our website. And we even like formatting. We had a journal who's like, who, who we like their format. We, we kind of talked to them and they're like, yeah, copy our formatting. Like there's stuff like that. So tons of help along the way. Brilliant. Okay, so um, just going back to the um, to the libraries, um, you know, uh, interested in and in how you go around structuring the support that you offer um, to the journals for indexing, um, and what bits you get really involved in, and and what um, really stays with the the journal editors. I think Emily, um, I think uh, you were. This was one of your questions. <laughs> Sure, yeah. Um, so I can say we do submit the application on behalf of editors. So we'll, we'll actually uh, submit it when the time comes. And then after that, we also um, upload the article level metadata into DOAJ. But as far as completing the application and then meeting the criteria, um, that happens in stages and it's a bit more of a collaborative process. So I'll say even when we're first talking to a journal, like a journal, a new journal starting, or maybe they're migrating over to um, our platform for support, we really do use the Directory of Open Access Journals application criteria to guide our discussions about how to go about setting up their journal, um, what kind of practices to establish, what kind of policies to establish. Um, so we'll, we're able to have conversations at that point around things like what should an open access statement look like and what does that mean and what are the creative commons licenses and what makes sense for you um ideally with an eye to when it comes time to submit an application a lot of those things will already be in place and so when it does come to that point of submitting an application um i think the process that i've used for the last few journals has been to copy over the application into a word document and then i'll fill in as much as i can and then send it back to the editor to review and uh, complete so i think in in abe's case for example i was like i don't know what keywords describe your journal you fill that in and then there were some other things that got flagged um along the way, I think Abe mentioned, you know, which publisher should we include and how do we word these things? Um, for some other journals, there's cases where it'll, we'll have to flag more significant things like, oh, uh, you don't yet have an editorial board. Here's a time to talk about that. And we'll provide um, documentation around it, examples of how other journals have set things up, examples of some language but we don't go so far as to establishing that ourselves we provide the resources and then have some back and forth um, as we finish working on the application um, so that's kind of what it what it looks like and it varies by journal based on you know how many things need to be modified at that point of uh, completing the application of course i mean it's obviously a great help for us when we're reviewing applications that you know someone like you is doing that check first because you know so often you get an application that you have to reject because you can't find uh, the copyright policy or the licensing information is confused. Um, so it's really great to to have that support um, to help the journal get it right first time, which is brilliant. So is that a similar process for you, Sonia? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, we do the same sort of thing where, you know, even before we uh, start working with the journal, actually, our, our proposal process um, sort of tries to set them up for success in a future <laughs> completely hypothetical DOAJ application. So we have some requirements um, before we start working with the journal to ensure that they're fully open access um, and that they, they are going to license their content with one of the Creative Commons licenses. Um, one thing that we do uh, with all of our journals is after, um, you know, every year or two years, we tend to do a review of our unindexed journals and see, um, we do like a quick scan of some of the major criteria to see if there are any that look like they're kind of, you know, reaching the point where a DOAJ application might be um, a reality for them. So we've sort of built that into some of our regular workflows. So every couple of years, we sort of conduct a scan. We've got a spreadsheet we're happy to share with other like libraries or publishing programs on this call if that's uh, helpful for you. Um, 
And then um, something maybe that em Emily didn't mention, but I, I might mention is the help that we receive from DOAJ when we've um, got a journal to a point where we think they are ready for an application. And that is that we reach out and ask for like an informal review. <laughs> and I think that's such a helpful step because it means that um, we're able to sort of catch anything obvious um, that we didn't catch on our own uh, from some of the expertise at DOAJ before we go through the work of submitting that application and making that formal request. Um, and then the other piece that we do that is, I think, helpful is that we keep all of our journals together in one publisher dashboard. So um, we can manage all of the metadata from one place and we can kind of track them in one place, which really reduce, reduces the workload for us if we're managing the metadata. Um, and I think it's actually easier to do that than to have the journals responsible for their own metadata because we end up helping them with it anyways. So this just ensures that we've got it all in one place. Um, yeah, as Emily mentioned, for us, it's the same sort of um, to split between responsibilities. So the journal is like solely responsible for um, the you know policies that they're developing and how they want to implement those policies. And we provide uh, guidance and templates and advice, um, especially when it comes to thinking of future applications for indexing abstracting services. Um, but they're the ones that really do have to do the hard work of um, making the decisions, right, and establishing the policies. Uh, and we're there to kind of provide the infrastructure and, and expertise to, to get them to that point. Excellent. Yeah, and I think you're right, you know, um, certainly from the library point of view, it is useful to have all the journals together. I know that we've, uh, we've worked with you in uh, getting journals that uh, had independently um, submitted, you know, into, into your your account. Um, so I think uh, I think that can be a really useful um, thing for libraries to do to just support the journals in that way. Um, so uh, time is moving on fairly quickly. Um, so uh, um, I guess uh, I shall probably need to uh, move um, our guest Jeanette, um, I think um, I was going to ask um, how you communicate um, from, you've got 320 journals on RUD, um, how do you communicate with them about the benefits of indexing um, and, uh, and, and support them in, in, in that process? So you, to a different scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, we, let, it is a little bit scaled down because out of those 320, a certain amount are scholarly peer reviewed and then a certain amount are also fully open access. So there are about 150 journals on the platform that are fully open access, therefore would be eligible uh, for DOAJ indexing. Now this was the 2018 numbers when the uh, project started, right? And it was modest kind of pilot project. Um, again, realizing resourcing and, and, and trying to embark on this as a thing uh, as a new project is learning experience for everybody. So uh, some of the things that uh, resonated have already been mentioned, the visibility, the quality, the professionalization. Um, and for the Eridzi journals, uh, Sonia mentioned the, um, uh, the ability to transfer that metadata. Now, not all, so many journals on the Eridzi platform are only using Eridzi for publishing. That's where their primary publishing location is. So um, essentially the offer to take care of that metadata transfer to increase that visibility was very attractive. Um, so of those uh, 150, the pilot project approached about 15 journals to say, would you like to try? And 13 of them embarked on the process and are in various uh, stages of being successfully indexed. Um, but in the Quebec context, uh, I think there uh, uh, will be a shift uh, in the future uh, since last year, the Fonds de Recherche de Quebec, which is a major Quebec funder of many of the journals that are on the ARZ platform has announced its intention to align with Plan S, uh, and criteria of which is indexing in the DOAJ. So that is going to be a significant uh, shift in how we work with and approach journals uh, since their funding will essentially be dependent on, you know, uh, uh, adhering to some of these criteria in the next several years. It's not happening tomorrow, but it is a process that will be embarked upon. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's something that that will certainly uh, change the appeal of indexing in DOAJ <laughs> uh, for Quebec uh, French language journals in the future, for sure. And certainly would love to have more French language journals 
in DOAJ mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. they are a little bit underrepresented at the moment. So, uh, and we have a, a group of uh, volunteers um, who who can work on on the French language. So um, that would be that would be really super. Um, so as I think we are um, at uh, ten before the hour, I just like you quickly to just say what you'd share with other people going through this process. Just um, just one thing that uh, um, you would share with other people that uh, would be useful, um, and then we will move to questions. So um, let's start with uh, Crystal. Um, Sure. So um, obviously, if you have the opportunity to plan for a DOAJ application from the start, that's very, very helpful. Um, uh, I think the other thing that we would do in retrospect is, is maybe plan a little more optimistically. Of course, we applied to DOAJ hoping that it would increase the visibility of the journal. Uh, but I don't think we were quite anticipating that our submissions would double within the first year. Um, and so as with us, especially with a small student team, um, we had a, a few growing pains with that, but it's been a great, uh, great thing. Um, and I think that high level, that increased level of submissions has been sustained and we are seeing submissions from other places around the world. So that's a really, really uh, great opportunity for our students to have that experience. So um, yeah, plan more optimistically, I would say. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> hey, what could you add to that? I would just say do whatever your open access librarian recommends you to do. <laughs> and and uh, from there, I would turn over to uh, Emily to answer the question. Perfect. <laughs> Emily, would you like to add to that? <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat something that Sonia said um, earlier, which is from the library perspective, kind of aligning your journal onboarding criteria or the guidance that you provide for journals um, at the start when they're first getting set up or moving to your platform with the DOAJ criteria as much as possible um, has really helped us. It's not something we did at the beginning back in 2017, um, as I mentioned, but it's something that we've tweaked over time and that has really helped with those conversations early on. Brilliant. Um, Sonia and Jeanette, do you, have you got anything briefly to add before we go to questions? Yeah, I, I would just say don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so there's lots of people that have been doing this work who I think are like absolutely willing to help journals and and library publishing programs sort of succeed in this. So like uh, DOAJ's documentation is great. The PKP documentation is great. Library Publishing Coalition created a guide for DOAJ that's openly available. You don't have to be a member to use it um, or reach out to someone you know is sort of successfully doing this. And I think we'd be really like happy to to share. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and I would say uh, from the from the sort of APG context and from I think in everything is is that that collaboration. Um, you know, I think uh, you hear it sort of with the journals and the library publishers, the journals and APZ, but also amongst everybody. So sort of like taking off the specific APZ hat for the moment and putting on a coalition publica hat um, as is my right. Um, I think one of the things that we'll uh, see and learn from is the work that's been done in that cadet context to work with librarians to identify strengths of you know the different actors in the system to be able to help journals along right so uh librarians who have strong expertise in um in the indexing criteria and everything but maybe have slightly less uh, capacity for analysis um, for um, a, a suitability of journals, for example, there could be some collaboration uh, to be done in there, uh, sort of transferring from the French language to the Canadian national uh, context. So I'm hopeful that I get to continue working with the fabulous folks on this panel and others mm -hmm. to to continue that collaborative work because uh, it is uh, it is the non reinventing the wheel. Let's learn from each other. I think is is a good uh, a good practice. Excellent, fantastic. So I think I want to say yeah, thanks. To all of you, that's been brilliant. I think we may have a few questions, Arush. Yes, and I. Yes, um, and I've tried my best to sort of synthesize some of the questions into themes, and one that came up was around communication. So um, we had a few questions around. So this application is sent out, and and I guess it would be good to hear about what the what the process might be on the DOAJ side. Um, Someone suggested it would be nice to have sort of status updates online. 
to know where in the pipeline an application might be. Um, and also maybe some questions and concerns around a conversation between DOAJ and journals in, um, instead of maybe a one-way conversation. Now I imagine there's significant resourcing limitations to yeah. that sort of thing, but I will turn it over to you to respond. Okay, sure. I think um, in certainly in terms of uh, applications that are submitted, um, <clears throat> if something is listed as pending, that means the review hasn't started. Um, a journal would normally get a notification once a review has begun. Um, so if, if your review is listed, uh, your journal is listed as pending, um, that means that um, the, the person assigned to that journal hasn't started the review yet. Um, it'll be, it's an interesting um, question, I think. Um, certainly um, each publisher has a, um, an account in DOAJ um, that, um, with a dashboard. Um, so I can go back and look at how we can improve um, the information on the dashboard to see if we can provide some more information about what um, stage uh, journals are at. Um, we try to, um, to review applications within three months. So it's a much shorter process than it used to be when I first joined DOAJ. You know, the, the timeline between application and, and um, final decision was, was very long. Um, but we've tried really, really hard to uh, to cut that down to um, something that is on average is about three months. Um, so I think it will. It's an interesting question. We can try and do that. Um, in terms of communication, there's there's a bit of a spectrum of of how much communication there is um, between um, the publisher and uh, DOAJ. Um, in some cases, um, there is some communication and we will ask some questions um, of the journal editor during the process of the review. Other times, um, a review is done and if enough things um, would mean rejection, then, then the journal could be um, rejected without there being any um, communication. Um, during that process. As I as you say, you know, quite a lot of it is dependent on um, time and effort. I think if there are quite a lot of things that that need to be done, then generally there would be a rejection with, with details of, of the information that, um, that needs to be improved. Um, if it's some small things, then we can contact the, the editors and ask um, for, for some small improvements. Thank you, Judith. We, we also had a question around disciplines. Um, something about uh, the DOAJ having, or accepting, sorry, um, editorial reviews from humanities journals. What are the plans, or are there any plans about something similar for social science journals? There aren't any plans. Um, I'd be interested um, uh, to know whether this is something that would be um, would be common amongst social science journals. Um, it's a policy that's been in place for editor um, for arts and humanities journals since well before I joined DOAJ. Um, so you know we require peer review, and there's this exception for arts and humanities journals only for um, that will allow editorial review. Um, so we don't get a lot of journals that only have editorial review, um, but we do occasionally. Um, but it's an interesting question. We're not really thinking about that because we haven't had any requests for it. But certainly, um, if there is a, a demand, um, then it's obviously something we would look at. But I'm not aware that there is a big demand. Excellent. Thank you so much, Judith and panelists for sharing your experiences and your expertise with us. Um, Judith, if I could just ask um, to end on the note of if there are questions, what would you advise folks to do? Um, if you have questions, um, then 
you can you can um, email me directly, um, um, Judith at doaj.org, or we have a help desk, um, which is helpdesk at doaj.org, um, and so we have people on there who who are um, in position to answer questions. If you have an application that's actually in process, then we ask for you, that you don't ask for an update until three months have passed because you know that is likely to be being worked on. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, you know, you can contact me or the help desk. Thank you, everyone. I will be sure to send out an email with uh, a link to the recording, and it'll also be posted on PKP and Coalition Publica channels for review. Thanks again and have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks very much.